Hello and welcome to the LCS where we are kicking off playoffs We're here. lounging. We're lounging. <laughs> it's Kobe and I, the usual lounge here. <laughs> that, and that's uh, us. we're joined yeah, by exactly. some, some guests. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Here. Oh, thanks for having me. No you know? problem. We thought we would bring you guys in for playoffs. You know, a little bit of a special treat for the fans at home. Mix nice. it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys for coming down from your ivory tower over there in the other studio room. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my um, but we can start right off the bat with uh, patch 14.5 update. The hotfix is in for Smolder. It was not in last week, even though the hotfix was on yep. live before the weekend happened. It had not actually gotten in in time to be on the LCS. So it is now going to be the hotfix version through all of playoffs. It is not the 14.6 nerfs that you may have seen, which are really gutting the champion. Yeah. Uh, but there are some some kind of nods down. And and say. specifically the ones that I had been looking for is the ultimate cooldown. I think this is this is a really good way to nerf the champion. I think that will be meaningful. Uh, the extra 20 seconds the definitely does hurt the wave clear. As you were saying though, these are not the the ones that have been popularized on social media right now that are mm -hmm. coming, yeah. that are going to chop Smolder actually down to size. Smolder is still going to be really good, yeah. uh, is still going to be a priority pick, just a bit more reasonable. And the extra 20 seconds on ultimate, I think is something that we'll definitely pay attention to and track in the games. Especially in competitive, a lot of the times what well, you'll see is like if you have Smolder alone on side lane, you're like, okay, maybe we can punish him. But the fact that it just like nukes the wave, <laughs> um, makes it really hard to actually try and either look for a dive on him or try to end on a team which just elongates games. The difference between stacks from the, the 50 stack scaling to yep. 150 stack scaling is also crazy. Um, but a lot of people kind of saw how much Smolder like dominated globally. Like LEC absolutely were really on the Smolder hype train. Same with a lot of regular season. So I think I think thankfully we're not on the Nuke Smolder patch. <laughs> Thankfully, I, I kind of like the looks of that patch. I just want to see if this one balances it to a good degree. I think it does. I think it does a decent amount. In LCS, you don't, you're don't you not see, seeing every team hop on Smolder immediately. Yeah, so. e even last yeah. week with the unhop fixed version, it actually went fully through draft a number of times. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, the big thing for me, Zier is still disabled. Which yeah. actually, like, so we've talked, we've jokingly, especially, <laughs> especially with... I don't. I don't think that's a sad. Turn piece. that frown upside down. Yeah, it, it depends. Uh, I think sad. it's more interesting for us. Yeah. Raz yeah. was also the quirky enjoyer. So well, I no. If you're a quirky you. enjoyer, you should be happy that now Azir is gone because <laughs> you get a little bit more. Uh, I think more control majors come out. Wait, why would you be happy? The only time people play quirky is into Azir. There were times. Look, <laughs> but but I do think <laughs> that you'll look. If people will look into their champion pool, I guess the more interesting thing is like Quay. More people are willing yep. to pick Quay, uh, but the other options are also Karma and. Corky, which is also boring, and I think Azir's play pattern, some of the sick Azir sex that we saw from Jensen as an example throughout the split, I'm a little sad that he's not here. I think the big thing with Azir is that it's a great pivot point in draft for mm. teams like, obviously, again, we've memed about FlyQuest. Jensen did that thing where they're like, you only have one champion left, and it's Orianna. We saw Ori permaband against yeah. him last week. Um, but I think the big thing is the draft flexibility that having the stable point of Azir allows for a team specifically like C9, where JoJo, that was a big draft point for them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Cloud9 obviously going to be playing today, as today is the first match of the 2024 LCS Spring Playoffs. It's an upper bracket match between 100 Thieves and Cloud9. Obviously, a lot of talk about how that will affect uh, Cloud9 as JoJo had a lot of wins on Azir here. Uh, but we have to talk about playoff experience between these two teams. Uh, it is obviously very different between the two squads. <laughs> Cloud9 has that. a wealth of, of playoff experience. And a lot of these 100 Thieves guys are actually just brand new, not even the playoffs, but to the LCS. Yeah, and this one I will just touch on the organizations to start, right? Because you're right about the players, and so the experience difference between the players on C9 and the experience difference from 100 Thieves players is for sure stark different, uh, and we'll touch on that uh, later on. But like, pretty good these last couple yeah. years. For the last couple of years, has been Cloud9 as the dominant brand and the dominant team. Anytime they've been players being picked up, they're like, it's the new Cloud9 super team. And that was, I guess, the expectation coming into this split, but that's the comparison to 100 Thieves, as you can see. Yeah, and I think it's important to remember that 100 Thieves still have been at the top. They had that year where in 2022 they kept making finals, but they couldn't get the win yeah. in those finals. Uh, and then into obviously last year was a much tougher year for them. Yeah. Um, but then as we look at the actual playoff experience between the players in this, it's really interesting because obviously this 100 Thieves team, none of their players were part of that victory. 
right? So you have a lot of players and River is just trying his best to drag up that average, but he still has fewer playoff games played than the lowest member of C9, yeah. which is Berserker at 46. The player with the most on 100 Thieves River has less than the least on Cloud9, which is Berserker, as you're saying. Uh, it's also worth noting that, yeah, 100 Thieves had some really strong years early on. You know, we saw that, you know, in, the, in this graphic. These last couple years, or last year, they didn't do as well. This year, they were expected to be having a performance more like last year, right? It wasn't the expectations that they were going to be, you know, at the top of the table. People were predicting them to be down towards the bottom. Yeah, and that's a huge credit to uh, the coaching staff, the scouting, uh, the fact that anytime you talk to the players, they really uh, support the environment of growth within the team to play how they play in scrims on stage. Not the same result, because that's been another conversation entirely, but they've been really comfortable and really bloody on stage. And so even though you have younger players with little experience like Sniper, he's still taking risks and it really is paying off for this team. And he, so there is a huge experience difference in, yes. in playoffs for both these two teams, as, as you all have illustrated. But I would like to do a vibe check on both teams because <laughs> the vibes are immaculate on the younger team. They're always so happy, so excited. Yeah. Even just to, to Look at this up. guy. Every time they show up at the studio and they keep on winning, people keep trash talking them, saying mm -hmm. they're terrible in scrims. Oh, you know, we want them in playoffs. JoJo is like, yeah, please give us 100 thieves <laughs> in playoffs. But 100 thieves keep on showing up to their games and they perform on stage and they're absolutely styling on the LCS. It is, to me, the most fun team in the entire league to watch. They played Shaco Jungle with a <laughs> Vagar mid, mm -hmm. and they stomped and won with it. So while there is a lot of playoff experience advantage on the side of Cloud9, um, sometimes the older players will be a bit more jaded when they're not winning all their games or not living up to expectations. And so it might actually be a little bit of advantage for 100 Thieves. Yeah, well, we know Kobe's a believer in 100 Thieves, but LCS <laughs> players have been pretty vocal about the skill level of 100 Thieves all split long. Let's take a look. There's no way they're better than them or them. Like, there's no I way. I mean, all I'm saying is, if I versus 100 Thieves in playoffs, I'm, I mean, I'm celebrating right yeah. now. <laughs> I can't drink, but I'm getting my beer and I'm bigger and I'm, I'm happy, bro. That's all I'm saying. I mean, so. I, I, yeah, we, do, we don't want to get creeped here, but I think anyone that plays 100 Thieves is good at free. Like. Uh, 100 Thieves, I feel like a kind of fraud, so I'm not, I'm not going to say 100 Thieves. Do I have anything to say to Pudge? I mean, the last time we played against each other, I did solo kill him. Oh. I was like out team fighting him the entire time. Mm -hmm. so I'm gonna just do it again against them, you know? I was hoping we'd get 100 Thieves in playoffs yeah. because I think they're absolutely free win. Um, I think they're frauds. <laughs> they are definitely here. frauds from my experience. I mean, I'm, yeah. I've, been, I've been playing 100 Thieves the entire yeah. time. Wow, wow. So oh, it's yeah. like you two think yes, 100 we already Thieves are fraudulent. Me too. Okay. We agreed it was, we agreed well, it was a 1v2. I think they're frauds. I, think. I'm, I'm just, <laughs> I just love messing with them. You guys can argue against off him and we'll just beat you again. And this all stems from their results in scrims, right? Yes. If you talk to any coaches, any pros, they will tell you that 100 Thieves is free in scrims. Corte J actually went so far as to call them team bonding day, I believe it was, <laughs> when they play against 100 Thieves. Because he says, when the team is frustrated, when the team's in a bad mood, you get 100 Thieves day in there, everyone's friends again. <laughs> Every, you know, you get some easy games. So everyone has been saying all split long that this team is free, but they keep showing up and delivering on stage week after week after week, and they're deserving of credit for that. Yeah, I think the big thing is whatever they're translating onto stage is super important. Because yeah. the funniest thing was hearing Ayla himself mention that they had lost at one point 17 scrim <laughs> games in a row. <laughs> And both Armeo and, yeah, and both they're you, improving a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Yon and Armeo were just like the audacity to actually admit that. <laughs> <It> is, <laughs> also, it's insane. But I, I think it speaks to again uh, the coaching staff around this too. Like not only I know Kobe, you said like vibe check, but I also think the players and coaching staff have had. On the whole, uh, outside of a few outliers, really good draft and really good understanding of how the players on this team want to play. Yeah, and Lego my Lego in chat, sandbagging scrims to give enemy team false hope. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's the constant strategy, at least within the, the podcast that we pulled, uh, the, what's it called, 100 Thieves kind of addressed it internally about like, they just talk about how the, they're a streaky team, right? Yep. Uh, but a major point that I want to talk about with 100 Thieves, as you can see here, they are just the bloodiest team still in the world, their champion kills per minute is the highest of all major regions. This also includes the LPL. So even though they're not showcasing the scrim results, 
they're still comfortable enough to take a lot of the risks in constant team fights that they do in scrims because of the environment of like, of course, the players encouraging each other and also their comms. And, and they don't want player. to showcase the scrim results. Yes. <laughs> what we've been told, that's a good thing. They yes. that under wraps. Yeah, we, we don't want to showcase the scrims. <laughs> we want to perform on stage. Yes. Uh, and they've done it. I think that also losing a bunch of scrims can be good for your mentality in a, in a best of five. If they're losing games in the best of five, we're used to this. Yes. Then the the coaching staff, yeah, can can get them in a, in a good spot and be like, all right, it's fine. Just focus on the next game. You know, they have more experience losing than anyone else. No, no, no one can take them down. All right, we have a returning guest to the broadcast today. Let's see what she has to say about today's matchup. Hey y'all, my name is Miss Kim Kim and I am so glad to be back at LCS. I know we have some banger games today, 100 Thieves versus C9, but did y'all know that Ayla and Vulcan actually have some underlying beef? And it all started with a tweet from Vulcan. Now, last spring split 2023, he said, bring back Winsome. So let me give you a little bit of backstory on this. Ayla was actually the starting support for FlyQuest, but he didn't have his visa in order. So Winsome had to step up from the challenger team of FlyQuest and play in his spot. Now under Winsome reign, they went eight and one. So after the roster change, Vulcan tweets out, bring Winsome back. This wasn't even shots at Ayla. He was just talking about how him and Winsome would play soccer after LCS games. So Ayla doesn't know this, so he decides to clap back. He says, promote Smoothie. Now Smoothie was the challenger player for Vulcan's team. Vulcan said he was gonna get the last laugh and he said that Ayla, you're not even pertinent to FlyQuest's success. They were eight and one without you. Well, eventually Vulcan and Ayla have to face each other. And so Vulcan actually takes the win, but to rub salt in that wound just a little bit more, he decides as Thresh, he's gonna hook Ayla, bring him out their Nexus fountain, and EG dog piles on and kills them one last time. It was a mess, but we're gonna fast forward to summer split of last year. Now, Ayla and Vulcan actually switch teams. So FlyQuest has Vulcan, EG has Ayla. Y'all, FlyQuest went 0-6 in their first six games. So Ayla said it's time for him to get his lick back. So he said Vulcan is not even good and his support speaks for itself. And now, then after that, they went 1-1 one one in the summer split. So FlyQuest wins one, EG wins one. So today's games are so important. This gives them bragging rights. This gives them Twitter finger rights. And I wanna know, are y'all team Volkiana or are you team Ayla Bela? And Twitch mods, go ahead and put up a poll in chat because we're trying to find out. All I know is today is gonna be some banger games and whoever wins, I wanna see some dancing at the Nexus or else you're gonna have to see me after today's matches. It's, it's kind of funny because this rivalry thing started out and you're kind of like, ah, Vulcan's kind of punching down on this yeah. guy a little yeah. bit. You know, he has the big reputation. He's the player with all this success, yep. all these accolades. It hasn't been so hot for Vulcan lately, though. They kind of failed with the, with the FlyQuest super team. Now he's yep. here on the C9 super team. Be like, ah, well, that was just a blip on the radar. They're not doing so well. That's why I love the story from Ayla's perspective, because at first it's like, ooh, <laughs> it's like a tough re-entry onto the team because of the visa issues that came through. But then like the evil genius's time was like a great, like, I guess, redemption period for him and the success that he had in um, Academy at the period that he was playing on Team Liquid Academy. Um, and then this split, where they're the second best split with a team that people did not believe in. So I need this back in my bloodstream. <laughs> All right, we got to talk about some other matchups, though. Kobe, talk us through the top lane, Sniper versus Fudge. Sniper has got to be one of the most exciting additions to the LCS in a long time. He certainly is. Uh, and, yeah, I mean, we all know this, this series isn't going to be a whole bunch about the bottom lane. Both of these teams have had a lot of success through the, the top half of the map. Sniper especially. Everyone was so excited when he entered the league. Uh, such a young child. There's so much hype behind him. But all the other top laners kept talking trash about him. It's like he's not that good because everyone else was hyped. And he starts solo killing everyone. He even started with Fudge, uh, getting a solo kill on him with Impact. So many of the great um, performers of the LCS and, and taking over a lot of this top lane narrative. He's fully embraced uh, a lot of these carry picks as well. Aatrox, Olaf. A lot of these champions, if you do get ahead, you can 1v2 a lot of situations. He has done just that. 
um, and, and really has been one of the big surprises here, 400 Thieves, that has allowed them to climb to, yeah. climb to the top. Yeah, and, and in those early weeks, people were like, oh, this is, <laughs> <laughs> that's insane. They would always like, Give up, but yeah, what about next week? Like, can you do it consistently? That's always been the question mark because of what people have been talking about from, you know, the inexperience and all that behind the scenes. But like, his last week was his best week, period. Seven solo kills. Like, he got player of the week. Yes, he got like, they tried to dive. <laughs> He's got the dance moves. Yes. Yeah. He's been gradually like improving from already a pretty good base. And so this matchup to me is a big one because it feels like really coming into it, the solo kills is already the one thing that's stark between the two. Yeah, I was gonna say the biggest thing is that he, he currently has 12 solo kills and the next uh, two people who are tied, I believe at five. Yeah. So he has more than double of the second place in the LCS right now. And Fudge was in that reel. I was gonna put that out there. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think what matters the most, of course, is like, first series that he's going to have, at least in the LCS, the first playoff series, uh, going up against Fudge. So I really want to see what Fudge can go for in this matchup. Yeah, he's been a lot quieter this split, but, you know, he has been really successful in the past. Mm -hmm. I think people yes. want to see Fudge get back to that. He still is the player with a lot more experience in this matchup, and if he can have a good showing here today, I think he can quiet a lot of the talk because there has been a lot of negativity around Fudge. But we got to jump forward into the jungle here. River versus Blabber, Emily. This is an insane jungle yeah. matchup. Yeah, I, I love this jungle matchup because I feel like it is still two very disparate styles, right? Like when we think of peak blabber, we definitely think of someone who is incredibly efficient, can get himself ahead and focuses less on his lanes. Meanwhile, River is known as kind of this jungler who has a really, really strong understanding of where he is in relation to the map. And when we talk about River's jungle awareness, I'm gonna go through the first five minutes of one of his games against FlyQuest just to show how he plays with vision and how he communicates with his lanes. So first of all, starting off, there's this little scrap in the bot side. We can, apparently this is gonna troll me. Um, so right here, it is not gonna pause. All right. Um, Right here, he's going to see that these two wards, these two vision wards are up there. He's going to path down towards enemy red buff, place a ward. He knows exactly where the bot lane was going to path through down towards bot. Um, and the big important thing here, he's gonna clear red and then go for one of his patented wraparound ganks. This is the style of gank that River is really known for, right? And why enemy teams always say, you never know where River is going to be on the map because of things like this. Clears his bot side, goes up, clears his red, clears raptors. And then when he comes to cross mid, this is still a very important gank, despite the fact that they do not get flash or, um, that Jensen to flash because it resets mid. He goes up topside and gets a kill up here. And I think the big thing I want to illustrate about this is just again, that early play where he's actually able to um, play around vision. And it makes me sad that I couldn't circle the ward on there, but knowing exactly where the enemy bot lane is going to path and being able to understand that, take the, like, the split second decision to do that early invade, get first blood and bot, go up, get first blood and top, all within the first five minutes of the game, and reset mid-wave so that Quid has more pressure in mid as well. Emily brought the baton, because if she doesn't like your jungle path, you're getting smashed. <laughs> she has, by the end of the day, <laughs> one of these junglers. <laughs> well, we did, I guess we don't really have time to uh, talk about Blabber just yet, but we will be talking more about him later. Oh, excuse me, I guess we're just going back up. Uh, you want to talk about the other side of it, Kobe? Well, I just think it's really funny, because I, whenever I talk to players, if I talk to a laner, then they're like, oh my god, River? is the most annoying jungler to play against. I hate playing against River. But if you talk to another jungler, then they usually say Blabber is, their t is the toughest opponent. Mm -hmm. And it's because of those different styles where River, a lot of it is these ganks, and, and he's so unpredictable. Mm -hmm. Whereas Blabber is usually a bit, a bit more predictable yeah. in the fact that he does a lot of full clears. But he's, he still is even really hard to play around as a jungler. It just kind of builds up so much pressure. Yeah, and in the last two games that these two teams played, I do think it's important to say that Blabber did actually do a pretty good job of, of tracking River. The first one was a Nocturne game that 100 Thieves ended up losing. And then the second game actually came down to a lot of team fights, which is where you also saw River with the team fight targeting on the Vi being able to lock down JoJo on Akali. 
Um, and that's where another facet of Rivers' play came in. But Blabber and C9 as a whole did a good job of kind of keeping him under control early as best you can. And to me, jungle is just all about time management. It's where you're going to spend your resources, where you're going to spend your time. And Blabber, so often throughout his career, is leading in farm, is leading in CSD, but is also you know, having the highest K plus A at 14, right? So it's like, if you can farm more than your opponent and make more ganks happen, you're just the better jungler. Yeah, anytime we go through like a, a replay of Blabber's performance where he has to look for a dive top bot lane or something where he's he's still influencing the map. Right because, place, right time. Exactly, right place, right time. He will always, if he skips a camp, he makes it uh, meaningful. The, like, I think it was in the second last week of the split where he had the Nidalee game with Renekton, like, he's always there on the right timings. So generally speaking, the pathing that he does, I think, has usually been proper, but his kryptonite has been junglers that have just thrown that to the wayside and have been more unpredictable, like Contracts and like River. Yep, but we've, there's been a lot of talk about drafts lately, and specifically for these two teams, so we've got to hear from the coaches. We've got Golden Glue and Mithy. Hey, y'all. I am here with coaches for C9 and 100 Thieves, Mithy and Golden Glue. Now, y'all's teams have been talking a lot of mess, so I'm trying to instigate and get y'all to do the same. So for 100 Thieves, there's been a lot of talk from the community that your team is some frauds. Um, how confident are you with proving the haters wrong and beating C9 today? Yeah, I mean, I think that everyone's calling us a fraud, uh, but it's just funny because we finished up the top of the standings. So I think we'll let our play show that uh, we're not frauds. And I'm, I'm just excited because I feel like C9's a good opponent to prove that against. Okay, very nice. Now for you, your players, JoJo and Fudge, said that 100 Thieves is going to be an easy win and they really want to play them in playoffs. Do you think it's going to be an easy win and how confident are you in beating them? No, no. I mean, I think it's good that the players, you know, talk trash with each other and hype themselves up. But like, you know, I've uh, back backstage, I've definitely been hyping 100 Thieves up and uh, there's a lot of merit to what they've done this split. So, yeah, I ho hopefully uh, on our part, we're more than ready to show up today. <laughs> This is not good enough. I need one of y'all to say something. The homie. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, good luck to both of you guys and we'll see y'all in game one. Well, it's gonna be an exciting one. Obviously a lot to prove for both of these teams. Cloud9 came into the split, the expected super team. So much of that was about the acquisition of JoJo when they signed this player, when they added him to an already star-sided roster. The expectations are you win this split or it's a failure, but it has been Quid who has been stealing a lot of the limelight here so far this split and has really been make, be, making people question who really is the better mid. Yeah, and I think the big thing to highlight with Quid is obviously he had a really rough year last year on 100 Thieves when he came in. Uh, JoJo was one of those mids who absolutely crushed him in lane. There was like a welcome to NA. But this year, I remember him telling Golden Glue, like he, he apparently came up to Golden Glue one day after doing well in scrims uh, and he wasn't able to bring it to stage until this year being like, Grayson, I got it. I understand now. Something is unlocked in my mind. And he's <laughs> it been clicked. an Yeah, it clicked. Something clicked. And he's been an absolute menace, just tearing through his opponents. And he's also been incredibly flexible. He's played 12 different champions this split, including that Aatrox flex that they had that was really smart against Shopify. So he's been so fun to watch. Yeah, the, the melee champions have definitely been big. The, the Aatrox that you mentioned, the Yone, also a, a preference pick for him. Um, honestly, I'm. this is the matchup that I'm probably most excited for, also because people are arguing about who's the MVP of the whole league between these two players. And while MVP is a regular season award, people are going to watch the series. <laughs> and be, be like, like, did you get it right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, this is, you, you kind of get, uh, you know, the, the proof uh, immediately. And even though people were really disappointed overall because of the expectations of Cloud9 with the team's performance, JoJo it has always been the one still performing in their losses. Huge Nico plays definitely uh, are going to come to mind for people. A lot of these big re-engages. Yeah, exactly. And, and for JoJo, for me, it feels like every champion that I would list, his Akali games have been great. We're seeing the Nico games. For me, I was most impressed with his Azir, which is why I think he's probably the biggest uh, loser of the Azir ban uh, coming through. Um, even in their losses, I feel like he has always been ahead of the pace in farm, having an amazing lane, playing side lanes well. And if someone is failing, either uh, bot side or top side, he is the one that has been keeping standard and keeping his team in the game. That has been the case for uh, him, even in, in, in their losses. 
Whereas Quid, Chris mentioned in chat, like a few people have been talking about it, everyone has been high on Quid because even with how bloody their games have been, I remember the Team Liquid game where they were like pretty far behind in the early portions of the game. That has actually happened a lot of times. He is the one that finds huge plays to get their team mm -hmm. back in. Uh, to me, it's the Talia, the Ari. Those two champions really give him, like a, I guess, a lot of flexibility in team fights to do mm -hmm. what he does best. So I'm excited for him for sure going into this series. And I think a lot of this series is going to be dependent upon this matchup. You know, can Quid find those big plays? Can he be that X factor? Uh, because I definitely think most people, well, pretty much everyone's going to favor JoJo in lane. He has just mm -hmm. been such a dominant laner. Yeah. I think best laner in the LCS bar none, not even just in mid lane, you know, anywhere in the league. This guy has been really, really good. Um, but it's going to be, you know, tough for Quid. He's got to have that high-level performance that he's been able to show all split long now in a really high-pressure environment. And I think that's true for 100 Thieves in general. That's one of the reasons that a lot of people are saying, okay, they are frauds. Maybe they're finished higher in the regular season, but they have these really defined play styles that potentially you could attack in a best of five, mm -hmm. right? We're going to find out if that's actually true today, but a lot of people's expectation is if you're going to play this aggressive as General Sniper, if you're going to play these specific melee champions, what if you get triple banned? What if Blabber's up there camping you? What happens then? And today, that is going to be what we'll have to find out. But we got to talk about some predictions here yep. because this is a really exciting series. It's our first one to kick off playoffs. You want to start us off, Raz? Wow, well, it's already oh, up it's there. Already I have it as a 3-1. <laughs> so I, I think we already see a, th a few 3-1s. Uh, my expectation is just like we just saw how Cloud9 performed in their final week. And I actually thought even it, their wins were quite huge or the last two weeks after the break. I think they sorted a lot of problems. And my biggest issue is once you get into a best of uh, five, you really have to challenge your champion pool once the you get start getting targeted. Um, that's where I think a lot of the problems will come in. I think... The games will usually get pretty slower in best of uh, best of situations too. So uh -huh, uh -huh. I give Cloud9 the edge. So we got three Cloud9s and, yeah. and then a 3-0 oh for 100 teams. <laughs> Where is that coming from? Everybody, every single weekend is telling me, oh yeah, Cloud9 is back. And then they're gone again. And then they have to come <laughs> back again. So I feel like... They just went out to get cigarettes. Yeah. 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 Cloud9 is back. back. Are you sure about that? And then they're gone and they're back. Are they really back? I mean, the, I'm sure that JoJo is back. You know, he 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 definitely he never left. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. He, he shows up every single day. But I have to say, with so many people underestimating hundred thieves, if you start at the top of the map and you actually look how a lot of a lot of the games are gonna go, if they're focusing on top side, would you say sniper or fudge has the advantage there? I think most people would say sniper from this year has definitely had the advantage up there. River is is a more creative, like, early ganking jungler. They can snowball. A lot of the champions played in top lane right now can 1v2, can kind of steamroll games. Yeah. Uh, I think 100 Thieves are still being slept on. I know so many people are just itching and waiting to be like, I told you so. They are frauds. <laughs> uh, but but honestly, I, I think they deserve credit for, for Spring Split and what they've been able to do on stage and the weapons that they actually have. Yeah, they definitely do deserve that credit, but we'll see if they can prove all the doubters wrong because we are going to be heading on over to the casters, I believe, for game number one. Here we see Cloud9, the super team turned lower seed, trying to turn that superpower into a playoff win here today. Going up against them is the surprise team of the league in 100 Thieves, hoping to put the FU in all those fraud allegations <laughs> been slung their way lately. It's LCF playoffs, baby, and it's starting right now.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the LCS playoffs. It's time to kick things off here on this lovely Thursday afternoon with the upper bracket. C9 going against 100 Thieves. Both teams, of course, will have a second shot if they lose here today, but they'd really like to start this one off with style. I'm Captain Flowers, joined for the series today by Jat and Emily Rand. How y'all doing? I'm doing great, and I'm really excited for this specific matchup to open up the playoffs because I feel like there is so much anticipation from both fan bases, the Cloud9 fan base, waiting for these best of fives to see if the team can finally turn on and the 100 Thieves fan base to say, hold on now, we've been beating people all split. Where is the damn respect? I think they get it if they can beat Cloud9 today. Yeah, and I think uh, this is a really interesting matchup stylistically for me as well, because when we talk about C9, again, we talk about the expectations put on this super team with mm -hmm. the names on this roster, how anyone can carry on the team theoretically. Yeah. But that has not happened in game or in draft, right? Where yeah. I think the big thing, even people who think like, oh, 100 Thieves are fraudulent or whatever they're saying, mm -hmm. have given credit towards the coaching staff, towards the players themselves, some of them being able to drop ego when necessary in draft to be able to draft really, really well around exactly what this team wants to do. And absolutely, I feel like these two teams match up in such an interesting way, as you allude to, Emily, because Cloud9 has been a dominant early game team that lacks cohesion. And yeah. 100 Thieves has been a weak early game team who is extremely cohesive. So they are very different in the way they approach the game. And even though they are very, you know, 100 Thieves is second place and Cloud9 is third place, only two games separate them in the regular season standing. So I'm expecting a very competitive series. All right, as we get into draft, let's just go ahead and make sure we're caught up on a couple of things. The Lounge did mention it, but we are still on 14.5, but it is the hot fix one for Smolder. Yeah. So the ridiculous damage on the E toned back a little bit, slightly longer cooldown on the ulti as well. He's still going to be really, really strong, but he's not going to be in that absolute broken tier anymore. Also worth noting, Azir is still disabled, mm. and we've seen both of these mid laners play quite a lot of Azir before. Yeah, and as you see, bans coming out from 100 Thieves. Oriana is a good one, I think, because much like Azir, Ori just gives you not only like a control point in mid, but also incredible teamfight prowess. Callista for the pushing bot lane, and then JoJo's Nico. Yeah. Whereas on the other side, Ari against the Quid. You never want to let River have Vi ever. Uh, especially if JoJo's going to be going towards an Akali again uh, for the mid lane, which is something he's defaulted to in an azir list world. And then the Varus. And 100 Thieves is the higher seed, so they have side selection in game one, and they chose blue. That's why they're a blue side, and Cloud9 is red side. For side selection throughout the rest of the series, the loser of each game will get to select sides for that game. So to start right. things off, we have 100 Thieves locking in the Nautilus, which I think is quite interesting, since that is generally what Vulcan was winning on after the break. When they were playing the Enchanter lanes with Vulcan, they found much less success. So right away, even though it's not the most popular first pick globally, I think it's a good first pick for this series. Yeah, and we see C9 coming out with the Senna initially. The My favorite composition that this C9 team has piloted all year was actually that Nidalee Renekton with the Senna bot lane. Mm. Um, and it is really interesting to see Senna show up here. She gives you so much draft flexibility, but there's been an ongoing conversation as we see Tom Kench locked in for Vulcan, another kind of signature champion for him specifically through his career. Um, the Smolder versus Senna debate, right? Yeah. Like, who is better in the bot lane? What is better? And I don't think this game is necessarily going to decide it, but we're going to see it. Absolutely, and I think it's a bit of a bot lane handshake here where you're just picking a little bit different styles. I will say that Berserker's last Senna game was very poor. He had basically the lowest soul rate of any player I've seen this year at about 20 minutes. So he has had good Senna games in the past. It's not like he cannot play the champion, but they're going back to the well on something that didn't work very well last time. All right, so we'll keep track of how those both stack up, literally and metaphorically, throughout the game. Worth pointing out, the Aatrox locked in here for 100 Thieves. Yeah. You expect it to go to Sniper. It yeah. is still possibly flexible to mid lane. We did see Quid do it once. It was a very specific counter pick into the Scion mid from mm -hmm. Insanity, so let's not pretend like that's going to be something that we're expecting to have with a high probability. But the answer from C9, they want to grab the Talia here before the second part of the bands come in. Yeah, and I was going to say, I really like this pick 
for JoJo because again, when we talk about yeah. how important JoJo has been to this team, it's not only that his laning is absolutely stellar, but it's when he's able to get out of lane and pay attention to his side waves after pushing in mid. Talia is something that has incredible team fight prowess. We have seen her rising in priority in general. Um, and I also think it's a takeaway from Quid because yes. Talia has been one of the champions that Quid has looked absolutely dominant on. And I think it shows a slight difference of draft priority between these two coaches right now, right? Cloud9 take the blind power pick mid Tilia, and Hunter Thieves take the blind power pick top Aatrox. And now yep. we're also expending bans on Fudge to make sure Sniper is in a comfortable spot. In terms of players that are taking momentum into playoffs, Sniper is probably taking more momentum than any player. Only 17, leads the league in solo kills, one player of the week, and now getting some draft protection from his team. And both teams are playing that draft protection game. It's the Yone and the Karma banned out from matching up against the Talia there in mid. It is the Renekton taken away from Fudge. I say taking taken away, but I feel Denied. like there, there might just be some happiness in Fudge from not <laughs> having to go to Renekton jail here for game number one. Yeah. Jax also banned out as C9 will lock in the Lee Sin very quickly for Black. And I think they're really trying to secure a stronger 2v2. Even though mm -hmm. Talia and Lee Sin are both blind picks because mid and jungle hasn't been seen by 100 Thieves, it's very hard to find two champions that would actually be stronger to 2v2. Because I think for Cloud9, they're saying if River and Quid run the game, they'll be able to win it. But if they can run the game with JoJo and Blabber, they'll take it. This is uh, fascinating here, though, with the Xin Zhao to have some power for River. Yeah, and Huey also locked in for Quid. Again, this composition is going to do a great amount of damage with the Smolder yeah. already, but Huey... Oh, TF top. Okay, TF fudge. top. Fudge willing to slam this one in game number one up against Sniper's Aatrox. How do you guys feel about this head-to-head -head here? Uh, I think it's really interesting because previously, I think when we have talked about Fudge, we talked about the Nidalee Renekton game, but we've also talked about him on something like Udyr, right? Where it's less of a power pick in terms of I'm going to solo kill you or I'm going to be looking for kills in top lane as opposed to I'm going to push out, I'm going to dirty farm, I'm going to use all of my pressure to take over the top side of the map. The TF is really different, but very fun. This is a very one directional team comp, I'd say from both sides. You can pick globals. Like a lot of times TF mid gives your team map pressure towards side lanes or yeah. Talia mid gives your team map pressure towards side lanes. They now have two solo laners whose ultimate is devoted to moving, mm -hmm. not to team fighting. So we have an even bigger disparity in the team composition's power where 100 Thieves, if they can group up and make it a control game, big advantage. If Cloud9 can blow open early games, 100 Thieves will not be able to touch side lanes. So there's a very big disparity in the way these two team compositions are powerful. Yeah, and that's where I think we really need to look at these teams' objective control too, because I think where C9 can take advantage of 100 Thieves, as much as we've talked about how smart River's early game pathing has mm. been in terms of getting his lanes ahead, it is around those objectives. And Senna is so great if you end up doing that swap and then keeping mm -hmm. her top side for grubs, depending on how these two junglers' early pathing goes. All right, let's rock and roll. Game number one in this best of five between C9 and 100 Thieves. 100 Thieves kind of surprising everybody in a good way throughout this split so far. C9, some surprises of their own, but mostly it's people wondering, hey, where's this super team that we were promised? Regular season can only tell you so much, mm -hmm. though. Best of ones, it's shorter because we have fewer teams overall. Now it's kind of time for us to jump in there and see who's the real deal. Golden Glue, the 100 Thieves coach, you can see his tweet right there. Playoffs, right? That, to your point, is absolutely what matters. And I, I want to go a little bit big picture since we're right at the start of the series here and talk about the 100 Thieves fraud narrative or the Cloud9 super team narrative. Okay. And All how right. I'm going to first address 100 Thieves. Okay. <laughs> I do think that being second place in the regular season is very hard. That's not something you can just coin flip your way to, best or ones or not. It's very hard. However, it pales in comparison to playoff accomplishments. So, yes, 100 Thieves is 10 and 4. They won two more regular season games in Cloud9. But I think the reason Cloud9 still has this belief from a lot of the Cloud9 fans is individually, the Cloud9 players have 13 LCS titles and four MVPs. The 100 Thieves players have zero and zero, but two more regular season games. So, <laughs> There is a huge resume difference between these two teams, 
But if 100 Thieves actually take down Cloud9 here in that best of five, that's where they can really get to prove themselves. Yeah, and I think when we're talking about the definition of fraud, can I just say, like, 100 Thieves have won too many regular season games, guys. Like, they're not fraudulent in that they are promising something that they're not delivering on, mm. right? So, Sorry, that's been bothering me, you know? No, it's it, it's all good. That's what, it's, well, then, uh, it's the early games. If you're promising something that you're not delivering, it's actually more accurate for Cloud9 so far. Ah, uh, because yeah. oh, of the super team. Okay, yeah, there you go. Eight there you 14 go. games. See, these are the conversations that you have during the early game. Everybody's just farming their minions. Everything's nice and slow paced here. Jojo and Quid will just keep trading back and forth ever so slightly. Uh, biggest difference you can see across the board in terms of farm right now is the top lane, but both junglers hanging around. Yeah, they mid. Go. Nice seismic shove coming out, and Quid is dead. It's first blood over to Jojo. And that is exactly why Cloud9 picked the Lee Sin to Leah. They wanted to win the 2v2 there, and they catch Quid with the skill shot. Both junglers knew that was a big deal. Both junglers knew that wave needed to crash. JoJo and Blabber are the ones who execute, and it's a massive kill. Oh, In and- chat, yeah, JoJo just typed, regular season matters, good job. That's wow. what I want to see in the all chat. JoJo getting in there, talking his smack. Let's see it here again. Yeah, and I mean, I think, again, to Jat's point, this is exactly why you pick it, right? You want to get ahead early. As soon as JoJo gets that flick, Blabber is in there. Quid goes down, that sets up this mid lane so well for JoJo. And I really like, too, how Blabber marks his opponent with the Sonic Wave, but then flashes for Tempest Cripple, knowing that Quid's gonna try to flash away to escape anyway, so that he saves the resonating strike damage for maximum execute to guarantee the kill. Yeah, and also just in terms of the mid jungle 2v2, the Hui is not a weak early game champion. I think that's something I believed was true of the pick early on, but I've talked to enough mid laners to know you can actually win a lot of these lanes early. So getting that kill and burning the flash almost ensures now that the Talia is going to be able to have push. And if you look around the map, the Twisted Fate is pushing in the Aatrox. It's melee versus range. He's going to be yeah. able to do that. The bottom lane also able to get priority because they're just stronger 2v2 with the Senate TK versus the Smolder Nautilus. So it puts River and Hunter Thieves in an extremely vulnerable early game position here because all three of their lanes are are in danger of being pushed in and that allows Blabber to go wherever he wants. So as we're looking at our, our tri-lane view here and you mentioned how top lane is going to be that range versus melee matchup, it can be kind of suffocating mm -hmm. to play into something like the TF. I actually want to take a look. We have a comparison between Sniper and Fudge in both of their first splits because I think both of these guys have had similar kind of stories being told mm. about them where they're willing to kind of flex. They're willing to be the guy who wants to be the carry, but they can also sometimes play it a little bit too hard, get a little bit too hyphy about it. It. And you can see there's your comparison right there. KDA was higher for Fudge. Solo kill for Sniper, though. This kid wow. is the solo kill king, man. Yeah, and I think the big thing that I really like about Sniper and has kind of defi uh, defined his entry into the LCS has definitely been how willing he is to go for the 1v1, like even sacrificing his lane at times Ooh. to be able uh, to as I think he's quit. dead. Oh, yep. Jojo Pune with the solo kill in mid lane, make it a two nothing to Leah five and a half minutes into the game. All right, forget about top lane. Uh, <laughs> C9, not only did they get that solo kill in mid, but Blabber had started up this early Drake, so they'll have Pryo on Drake stacking as well. Uh, C9 are absolutely dominating this early game. Yeah, Jojo continues his all chat, uh, regular season team, ja, 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 right after that <laughs> second solo kill. So uh, I, I actually would believe that Hunter Thieves has him muted. You never know whether yeah. or not he's been in, right. in their head or not, but this speaks to the regular season early game dominance and regular season early game weakness of Hunter Thieves and C9, but it's actually just amplified right now. They got the flash off of Quid. He lands yet another seismic shove. And because he's cleared the minion waves with Fade Rush, Quid is actually just completely caught out. That's a situation where Quid needs to let that entire wave crash. He needs to let Jojo hit level six and be a little bit more passive. I think they were trying to set up a gank with River, but he just got caught by the skill shot once again, and it goes from bad to worse for Quid. Yeah, and in terms of objectives, it looks like we might see a little scrap around Grub. Hold on, oh, Blabber huge. is about to die to the spiraling despair, and it's Quid picking it up. Now JoJo's under pressure, and River and Sniper are both looking to take him down. Oh, Severing bolt over the wall, won't find the target, and a nice little sidestep from JoJo prevents it from becoming an even greater tragedy. But 100 Thieves needed to find that pick there. Nicely done.
Yeah, that's such an important contest for them too, because like I said, it also stops this kind of grub stacking that you can do with Senna and then do that kind of lane swap with her. That's one of her flexibilities Ooh. as we're fighting in bot lane now too. Nicely done. There we go, Ayla. Finding the dredge line on Vulcan, We're locking him everywhere. down underneath the turret, back up in the top side. This could turn into a 2v2 very quickly. Already one grub for 100 Thieves. Looking to grab this second one. Blabber wants to contest it. He'll walk up. He smites at the very end of the health bar just to guarantee that he can secure it away. Just anything to make sure they don't get all three. No six grubs for either team. Still a 1.3 thousand gold lead for Cloud9. But that type of recovery is very necessary for 100 Thieves. They don't need to win early game to win this game. They need to survive early game to win this game. And getting that kill on that grub is big. If they can go for the flashless JoJo, it's huge. Oh, JoJo, man. One more hit from that three talent strike would knock him up. But River doesn't have enough to guarantee the CC. Now Sniper's going to get ganked by Blabber. Top side's not looking good for the 100 Thieves. As Sniper can't fight his way out of this one. And Fudge is on the board. Yeah, I mean, uh, we talked about combined kills per minute going into this game, right? Mm. And Blabber uh, has been everywhere on this map, which yeah. is really interesting, again, considering how they drafted. I was thinking, like, okay, maybe they'll do, like, a, a Blabber carry comp, you know? with They mm. take the Xin Zhao, they take a Kindred or something. They play for him like he's Milky Way. Um, but I love seeing this out of Blabber, too, because, again, his understanding of where he needs to be on the map how he can combine, where he needs to shut 100 Thieves down in their solo lanes, because this is a team that primarily plays through those solos. They absolutely do, and I think last week was a huge showing of that for 100 Thieves, where Sniper was just able to generate a lot of solo kills on his own. That's not something that is likely to happen this game. The fact that he's already 17 CS down, has been killed by the Twisted Fate and the Lee Sin, and has generally been under his turret for most of the game. You add on top of that, that River hasn't really had any freedom to move to top lane because he's needed to take care of this way in the mid lane thanks to the pressure Blabber has been giving. And it just limits the ways in which Hunter Thieves can win this game. 2,100 gold, now the difference at nine minutes. So we know that Cloud9 looks their best when they are smashing the early game. And right now, nine minutes into the game, 2,000 gold ahead, one Drake, plus the extra kills, even Grub State, like you said. So it's not yeah. like there's this mm -hmm. inevitability with split pushing later on or something. Combine that with the fact that even if they did want to split push with Grubs, you've got Talia and Twisted Fate to catch guys out. Yeah. C9's early game seems to be going their way. Yeah, absolutely. And it's been a really interesting year for Cloud9 because I'd say... We had the off-season hype of them being a super team and asking, will they ever lose? Then they went on this four-game losing streak, but I'd say their general play style stayed fairly consistent throughout. They were trying to snowball early games, and then it was whether or not they could actually turn that win lane into a win game, but they've generally lacked cohesion. So I'd say this is a slightly larger early game lead that they've had for most of the split, but I think it's still yet to be seen if they can pilot this team composition to victory cleanly. That's actually why I kind of really like the Grub contest as we see River kind of polish off that last one is that I think where C9 have had problems with say like a Lucian lane, right? It's mm -hmm. kind of transferring that pressure and making the most of it in the mid game around the map. Nice, That's Quinn going in and Ayla's ready to follow up right behind him for the lockdown. Spiraling Despair gets it done. 100 Thieves playing aggressively with the Huey Flash to find the Jojo kill. And that actually evens the mid lane, if you can believe it. The 2-0 JoJo had an extra 150 gold bounty. The wave got caught by Quid afterwards. He's actually ahead of the Talia in gold now after that disastrous die to the level three gank, get solo killed at level five start. Yeah, and this is great for 100 Thieves mid lane, especially if they can get the next set of grubs. As I see, Blabber is now mm. down getting that second Drake, which is actually, again, great objective control from mm -hmm. C9. And I like the fact that we're bringing up, hey, mid lane's actually pretty even. It's slightly 100 Thieves favored because the game itself is still over one and a half thousand gold favoring yeah. C9. And it's because when you look at these side lanes, 100 farm versus 78, 97 versus 82, comparing the to Tom Kench over to the Smolder, Cloud9 side lanes are still farming better. And 100 Thieves is gonna either have to stop that or make up for it somewhere else with another big play. 
Yeah, and the thing that they've done really well, again, is use that Drake, uh, that bot lane pressure to transfer into early Drake stacking, right? Yeah. Because even if you're looking at, oh, we're kind of afraid of the scaling on Smolder, we're afraid of the mid-game uh, damage that this Quay is going to be able to do, they bridge that by stacking these drakes early, right? Because Senna can actually be a monster late game as well. Mm -hmm. um, and if they can, again, spread that pressure around the map, which is what I'm going to be seeing from C9, right? Because it's not like they don't get early leads. It's that what are they going to do with that early lead? And I think the player that will need to do the most with his lead is who we have on screen right now, Fudge is TF. He has Static Shiv, so he can push waves even faster. And he has a global, not to mention he has a 1,200 gold lead on Sniper. And we brought up that graphic earlier about Sniper's very successful rookie split and Fudge's rookie split, which in retrospect is surprisingly successful because yeah. when he first came in the league, a lot of people thought he was bad. But within that same split, he actually won the LCS title. So he would know that you need to respect younger top laners. And he's really putting a two sniper early game here. Blabber trying to, again, maintain control over neutral territory here, stepping up with JoJo. There's there Fudge! That's the global you guys are talking about. C9 with the three-man play to pick off River. Yeah, I love as soon as Jack called out, okay, you know, Fudge here was his first year into the LCS. What is he going to do with this lead? That first... TFO coming in. And Sniper. Yeah, Sniper making his teleport entrance to the fight as Ayla and Meech deal with Vulcan. And Sniper forces Berserker to flash away this? to make his exit. <gasps> Ayla dies to the Dawning Shadow. C9 are not just going to take this one lightly. Vulcan still with that flash. thick skin ready to go. He might just be able to escape. He survives the Comet. <gasps> An absolute failure from 100 Thieves in the bottom lane. C9 outplays him and slays him. We're pretty close to going next after yeah. that situation because they use the Twisted Fate ultimate to get a kill in the river. Then they use the Senna ultimate and their own damn wit to win the 2v3 in the bottom lane. That just goes from bad to worse for 100 Thieves because they get 3v1 ganked and then they do their own 3v2 gank but lose both sides. What a sequence by C9. Yeah, and now Sniper is going to have to walk back to this lane. He's not going to be able to catch most... Uh, or some of this wave up topside, and another plate goes to Fudge as we see the bot lane play again. Yeah, and this, I really did like the start of it for 100 Thieves, but it's a little bit of greed here where they're trying to get both and they get none. Sniper just straight up goes to Berserker, wants to get the soul kill. I don't think Sniper's flash is quite up yet. I'd say Berserker timed his root and his flash very well, but if Sniper just immediately goes for Vulcan, they can potentially burst him before Ayla even goes down, and then Vulcan wouldn't even bother expending his flash because he'd be dead anyway, but because he got the kill, he limits the CC, he saves his flash until Sniper is used to spells, and it's just expertly done by both Berserker and Vulcan, but it all does stem from 100 Thieves feeling a bit of pressure and mm -hmm. not wanting to take the one sure kill, going for two and getting zero. Yeah, and it's so important, again, also just for that topside matchup, right? Because it continues mm. to widen the gap that Fudge has over here, especially since his first play worked out so well. As we see them turning on to Rift Herald, I am curious All right. if C9, C9 should there. fight this. Yeah, they should be able to very easily. 100 Thieves have four players already in the river. Sniper could rotate over, but remember there's no teleport for him to try to get a superior angle if that's what he wants. Nope. Harold down to 2,000 HP already still. One more proc on the eye. Harold slain by River and 100 Thieves. C9 are not going to contest. Interesting choice there. Jojo did have teleport, but he'd rather take the solo turret gold for himself, and they're betting that 100 Thieves isn't able to make good use of that Rift Herald. Objective bounties were not up yet, so it's not like a Giga Herald, which just boosts you an extra 500 gold. And yes, it does give a small window of 100 Thieves can get a pick, but at the moment, I think C9 is thinking if we just hold this lane pressure, let's let 100 Thieves invest five people. We're going to get the bot lane and the top lane pushed. They think they can make more plays off of this. They did kill the bot turret, and you can see the top turret is one gank away from falling as well. So if you guys are calling the shots right now for 100 Thieves, this game state is pretty dire. You're 4,000 gold down. They've got both of the drakes. What do you do to just try to hold on in this game? Is it just start praying and hope that Smolder hits 225 really fast? Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Smolder is always a win condition, right? Like, even with the nerfs that came through on the hotfix, I think Smolder is still remarkably strong. Um, 
as we see what they're going to do with this mid lane scrap. Yeah, I, I think as well, Flowers, what they're going to do is they're actually going to try and fight this dragon because okay. they're getting picked off so much. They can't control River Vision because of the multiple globals, but they use this window. They push bot lane, means they get first set up on River. And this is the one fight where they don't think they can get flanked from behind. So they can control the fight lines, maybe get a 5v5. They look at the items. They're not that far behind in items right now. If they secure this dragon, they can guarantee themselves an extra four minutes. So they're going all in right now. Sniper walking over through mid lane. He's going to at least answer the wave that C9 is trying to crash in there. But Blabber is still hanging around to at least make River and the 100 Thieves sweat as they try to approach this Drake. It's still down to about half HP, but C9 has moved in. C9's got control over the Drake pit now as River jumps in. And the Dragon is secured by 100 Thieves. Mom comes in over the top, but River's been kicked back into C9. Blabber dies to do it, and River stays alive to the Dawning Shadow. Sniper with a flash back over the wall makes his exit. But now what about the rest of the Thieves? Dredge line won't hit Fudge, but he can't get in range for a gold card. Stared. Okay, okay. All right, I was worried for a second. I thought we might get another re-engage, but we're good. We're Listen, good. perfectly done by 100 Thieves. Yeah. They had no risk of getting flanked by the Twisted Fate or Talia. They got the Smite Steal, and then they also didn't even lose the fight. The extra reason I think this was good is because if they do actually get aced, they're not giving up Baron or anything. This is why I think it's better to fight this Drake than the Soul Point. But Emily, take it away. Yeah, so, I mean, we see the Talia wall go down, River goes in, ends up getting the Smite Steal, which is obviously Oof. really, really important to get that Drake. But I think even more important, like you said, is the fight that ensues where they're able to get a one for zero on the backside here. And if you look at the way C9 actually needs to approach these fights. <laughs> oh, we almost had audio there. I wanted to see what he was saying. Yeah, <laughs> Golden Glue is pumped about that one because that's exactly how they need to fight. Cloud9 does not have good straight forward or as Core JJ used to say, eye contact fights where it's front <laughs> to back. The best tank is Tom Kench, but he's kind of peeling anyway. Their two solo laners are weirdly mid-range, and then maybe you have Blabber trying to fly in for a kickback, but he could get way feared, which by the way, just interrupts all dashes because it does a little knockdown effect as well. So you just get interrupted in midair and way better frontline engage from the Nautilus. So yes, it is 4,000 gold difference, but the amount of time that Hunter Thieves bought themselves there is is massive. Like I feel like they turned an 80-20 game into like a 65-35 game. They're still not up the mountain yet, but they started to come back. All right, 100 Thieves trying to put that Herald to good use up here in the top lane, looking for the tier one. A TP coming in from Cloud9 to stop them from being able to finish the job. The turret still stands with about half HP. This is kind of the problem of having that Aatrox and the TF matchup. Aatrox never got to the point where he could do any meaningful work on the turret up until this point. So you've got a long, long way to go before you can get rid of that. Still a four and a half thousand gold lead here for C9. Meech at half HP here in mid lane. Worth pointing out, 160 stacks here at 19 minutes mm. on the mm -hmm. Smolder. So probably again, sort of around that 23, 24 minute mark that appears to be most common for Smolder in the LCS. We'll see him get online with the 225 and that's when you can start feeling a lot stronger in these fights, I think. Yeah, right now I think we're on hashtag Smolder watch for 100 Thieves, but then <laughs> additionally for C9, where I really want to see them shine now is in spreading 100 Thieves on the map so that they have complete side lane control, right? Okay. Because you have a Talia, you have a Twisted Fate, you should be able to completely control where you're applying map pressure so you can avoid those front to back team fights where yeah. 100 Thieves should be able to beat you. And I think the way they can manifest that is in the rivers. So when 100 Thieves is trying to get control of the bot or the top river. I think that's the best place to strike because in theory, that's where you could have the TF and the Talia joining kind of at the same time to get a pure numbers advantage. So situations like this, and this is where 100 Thieves has to be very careful. When Sniper is showing on this wave, other people can't show because if you show too many people at once, Cloud9 can guarantee their numbers advantage. So they did it really well there. He was showing, Smolder went to, to Raptors. Now he's not showing. Now they can show in the bot and the mid lane. Also want to point out, since we're talking about Cloud9's ability to set up these picks, make these plays, second fully completed item for Fudge is the Rapid Fire Cannon. Mm -hmm. Not the highest DPS option, but so good for playmaking. JoJo flashing away from the Severing Bolt as River cool. needed a little bit more distance to catch up to him there. The Phase Rush doing so much work to get Talia away from the pursuing Xin Zhao. Yeah, and then as we see Fudge continuing to push out this top side wave, I do really like how C9 have tried to set this up. Um, invading on this top side now, really making sure that Fudge has coverage, and they're actually TPing in for this. So they'll probably set this up with a Talia wall to take down this turret. 
Yeah, they're kind of trading gold there, though. Like, Hunter Thieves is going to clear the wave as best they can. And if Quid is able to get that bot lane turret, this is a fairly neutral trade for Hunter Thieves. I think it's still... I, okay, fairly neutral. Slightly favored for Cloud9 because it's an, uh, a second tier turret and it's better Baron control. But like gold wise, it really doesn't move the gap by that much. Yeah, yeah. we've been sitting at this four and a half thousand gold mark yeah. for what feels like, you know, five, six minutes now. C9 trying to snowball the lead even further. Seismic shove does not connect on River, but it's all about the minion wave. Just get it shoved up, be ready to answer into this that tier one turret. But here comes Hunter Thieves. They lane gonna find the dredge line, but River's here in the front with a crescent sweep as soon as the fight starts. That's a huge kill on Quid. Cloud9 ends this one before it really gets going. Blabber does it, and now they're gonna turn for Baron. I don't know if they actually had eyes on that. TP, but they made the right engage and they struck before 100 Thieves can make the flank happen. The hook missed, Blabber's kick landed, and they're going straight for this Baron, but 4v5 and 100 Thieves doesn't want to give it up. 100 Thieves are thinking about it. Still not enough stacks on Smolder for the execute. Ayla goes Asshole. in, finds the dredge line this time. Fudge having to flash away, and now Sniper's about to get bursted down. Vulcan versus River, but River is very low. Berserker has got the kill on Sniper, and the Baron's not going to be low enough to steal as River tries to get himself away, but it's a double kill back over to the center, and Berserker is popping off. 100 Thieves are falling down, and Cloud9 is running the show. Yeah, that was so good from C9. Again, we have talked about where you could potentially beat 100 Thieves with their experience, right? And it's mm -hmm. in these objective setups. So it starts with this team fight in mid. Obviously, Sniper wants to come through with the TP, but he is too far away. And so as soon as they're able, oh. Blabber's able to get that kick onto Quid, he evaporates. Uh, and then the fight's over, right? Because 100 yeah. Thieves can't contest this. Sniper already knows that, so he goes back up. And then they try to contest this, but doesn't work out. So one important thing about this replay as well that you all were not able to observe, as soon as Baron was slain, JoJo types second place team so good, but he's clearly <laughs> typing with such speed and passion that half of the words are misspelled. So <laughs> he's really getting into the emotions of the mid game here as Cloud9 now commands an absolutely remarkable lead. Seven and a half thousand gold. They're on sole point now and they're forcing down the tier two in bottom lane. And I'm actually expecting 100 Thieves to not take this lightly. I think they know with the sole point that they're in relatively dire situations. If they can find a flank engage or see any window, I think they're going to go for it. Like this whole year, 100 Thieves has not let themselves get starved out. In fact, one of their wins against Cloud9, they were also down about 8,000 gold. That was a game where Berserker Zeri had a pentakill and there was a crazy fight when they had Baron and they took them out. So 100 Thieves, like you always have to be ready for them to strike, even if this game feels one for Cloud9. And we are just about to reach 225 for Meech. We're almost there. He just there it got is. it. All right. So we'll see if it's smoldering time for 100 Thieves. Yeah, about average 225 stack time for Meech. It's two minutes faster than the last time he played Smolder, which I'd say is pretty impressive in a game where they've been this losing, right? They haven't been able to initiate their own skirmishes. They haven't been first onto waves. So Meech has done a pretty good job of getting the stacks. What he doesn't have is items. Mm -hmm. Stacks yeah. are one thing, but you need your Q to, your, your super true damage Q to actually do some damage. He doesn't even have a second complete item yet. Yeah, and then you look over across the other side. Fudge now with the Storm Razor completed for the Twisted Fate top deck build. The first card off the top of the deck just goes kaboom. <laughs> it's not exactly the best thing to be on the receiving end of, but it's a great tool for helping set up these plays for C9. You've also got another item completed with the opportunity on Berserker's Senna. 3-0 and 1. He's got 111 souls of his own. C9's wallet advantage is huge. 100 Thieves are not going to get a whole lot more chances to not come out on top in a fight. If C9 group up too much, they can get played, but otherwise they're in good spot. River here on the start, immediately had to pop the ulti. He was almost burst down. The fear on JoJo forces him back now as well. 100 Thieves still looking to chase after him. Meech and the rest of the Thieves dig in and defend. They force C9 back enough to at least remove the pressure for now. Yeah, and I mean, Quid is still in a weirdly good spot mm. given because he's been given all of the side lane farm, right? Yeah. Like he got that bot side turret. He ended up getting top side turret. Um, so he's not in a bad spot in mm. relation to as Ooh. we see Sniper is going to get caught out top side. Want to talk about bad spots? Yeah, it's this guy. That's a yeah, bad spot. Unlucky. Yeah. Uh, it's a bad game for him too. He is five and a half thousand, four and a half thousand gold down against the Twisted Fate. Zero three zero. So absolutely zero kill participation. 
after having his best week ever as an LCS player. So he reached his peak, and at the moment, he's feeling it. It'll be really interesting to see how he will respond to this in Game 2 as a 17-year-old rookie. He's got so much confidence inherently, but yeah. to get knocked down like this against a player in Fudge who had a very off split, but is extremely accomplished. So Fudge has been in so many high pressure MSI Worlds LCS finals level experiences, whereas Sniper here is in his very first playoff game and at least for now has fallen flat on his face in game one. So he will have to bounce back as the series progresses. Yeah, and looking ahead, I mean, we look at the other side where Fudge locked in this counter pick Twisted Fate top, right? And we're yep. like, okay, how is this gonna go? Because outside of, again, stuff like the Udyr, uh, or even the Renekton, where he just takes complete control over the actual waves yeah. in topside and plays with pressure that way. He hasn't had like a particularly stellar standout like carry mm. split, right? Um, so him being able to lock in this counter pick going forward tells 100 Thieves, okay, now this is another facet of C9. We weren't sure that we had to worry about. We now have to worry about it. And I would say compared to the regular season or even the last week version of Cloud9 we've seen, this has been a more decisive team. They had the early game lead, but the instant we said, okay, Fudge needs to do something with this gold lead, yeah. bam, he killed mm -hmm. River. Oh, this Berserker Vulcan bot lane hasn't been performing. Berserker hasn't been able to get stacks on Senna. They win a 2v3, 126 stacks to 27 minutes. Still not great, but it's actually decent with the way he's played this game, 3-0-1. Now, 47 seconds away from a potential Infernal Soul. Very difficult for 100 Thieves to make an approach. Cloud9 want to close the door on this game one. And turn your eyes to the top left part of your screen too. That timer for that Drake is going to almost perfectly line up with the timer for Baron mm. as well. Having both of these buffs active on the map at the same time always feels hugely favorable for the team that's sitting on Soul Point because it's so easy to pull your opponents back and forth, make them make bad decisions. 100 Thieves are going to have to be clean with the execution if they want to keep surviving in this game number one. Ayla getting away there. C9 moving up. They wanted to see if there was an angle mm. for Fudge, but not quite. Nothing hits over the wall. Sonic Wave and Seismic Shove both going wide as the poke gets thrown back and forth between both sides. Berserker, look, it just takes okay. a quarter of River's health in one shot. C9 falling back now yet again as 100 Thieves bring Sniper back into the fight there with his Unleashed TP. Oh, Sonic Smash. Shadow nearly kills me. Dredgeline goes back in, but I don't even know if Ayla wanted it. They try to put the burst on C9. The Spiraling Despair on Blavering gonna kill him, but it takes him low. Sniper and Ayla even lower. Meech also at 20%. C9 makes their way over to Drake. They've still got control. And with that 10,000 gold lead, they were actually able to win an eye contact 5v5. That's kind of the break point they needed to hit in this game. Because if they can win a mid lane ARAM with this comp, as well as completely dominant dominate side lanes, there's not many ways for 100 Thieves to win the game. Yeah, and that's Infernal Soul down for them. They also have incredible vision control as, you know, the last ditch effort from 100 Thieves. River is going to try to clear out some of this vision around uh, Baron, but they have complete control of the map too, right? So yeah. wherever 100 Thieves are trying to fight them, they have to ensure that their setup is so good and so clean and their team fight targeting is so clean that they end up beating the advantages. I don't know if it's possible. Yep, I think 100 Thieves is about to flip something. Okay, That's the way this is Might feeling. As well. I think they are at the Baron pit, so they would like to get Cloud9 there as well, and they want to fight them. I think that's their best 10% chance way of winning this game. You think it's high as high as 10? Five, 10? Once okay, you're I mean, low, I'm, It's a legitimate question. No, you're, you're down right. I need to so think much. It. You're down 10,000 gold. You're down an infernal soul. Your opponents have total control over everything. Item advantage is pretty much everywhere. I'll put it at five. Okay. Yeah, I'll put All it right. at five. That's not bad. If you're, then... if you're in solo queue, it would be like 15. But if yeah, it's a playoff right. game, it's it's 95% C9 win. Spiraling Despair on Fudge. Quid still getting jumped on, though. He's trying to get away. He escapes and just barely survives thanks to Ayla and the shield. Mob Ooh. comes in over the top, but Sniper's already in the dirt. River tries to flash over the wall. Crescent Guard to knock a target back away. Fudge is still going to just kite him out, and Vulcan gets the kill. C9 pick up two, almost three. Any dreams the Thieves might have had of fighting for this Baron are dashed. Yeah, and there you see exactly what we're talking about, right? Like C9 with the control they have over the map with with the advantages they have they can just wait for a play like that and even when 100 thieves try to respond like sniper in particular he's supposed to be kind of this front line for this team mm -hmm. and he is dying before he can even zone anyone off yeah he has less gold than vulcan he is the poorest player like other than ayla in this game 
Well, Sniper is so far behind right now. Okay, other than Aelin River. Everyone on 100 Thieves is behind. Yeah. Cloud Nine's really rich, <laughs> that's the point. And when you look at champions that want to be on the front line, that want to be soaking damage, you have a traditional tank who's just a giant brick wall, or you have a drain tank. And yeah. when you're behind, playing a drain tank feels awful because you will mm. die mm -hmm. before you can do any of the draining that makes you tanky. Yep. He's got two lethality items. It's not like this guy yeah. is building defensive. This is not something where he can just go in and soak all that burst, and C9 knows it. There's pretty much no bad target you can select on 100 Thieves because the damage is so high, they'll burst anybody down. Now they've got the full five-man squad pushing down top lane. They're an empowered minion, so Hey can't just clear them away with a Magma Fissure. Jojo throws out the Weaver's Wall. 100 Thieves still trying to defend. Rivers over in mid wanted to clear that wave out, so Cloud9 can't just bounce back and forth between the two and apply even more pressure, but C9 keeping it on. I will say the way Smolder wave clear is pretty immense, but now Cloud9 finally gets to take a few shots. Jojo gets hit by the snot bubble, but not a whole lot more gonna follow that one up. Dredgeline wanted to go in, but not quite gonna find the hit. That means the tier three turret falls here in the top lane. Inhibitor is your next target. C9 not stopping anytime soon. Berserker using the heals to make sure that Jojo doesn't get too low. They want to keep this going. Backing up now because they don't have a wave ready to go in mid that was already cleared out. Bottom lane's also not ready to crash. So C9 is gonna regroup, reset. They've still got another 75 seconds on this Baron. Yeah, and even you see there, even if they're not going for the fight, they still have the tools to be able to zone all of 100 Thieves off of these inhibitors, right? Yeah. I will say, as far as 14,000 gold leads go, this is one of the weaker 14,000 gold leads I've seen. <laughs> Does that make sense? How, no. how many 14,000 gold leads <laughs> have you like, seen? Exactly. In the, your entire <laughs> lifetime, Jet. Usually the game is over before it gets to 14,000. Okay. <laughs> so the point is that with the TF Talia, the 14,000 gold lead, you still need to be a little creative to end this game because they don't have true tanks. They don't have great engages. Again, they're still probably going to win. But I I'm saying there's a chance with the way Hunter Thieves, like they only lost one inhibitor down Soul Baron with a 14,000 gold deficit. Did you hear the guy in the did, audience did who just you, yelled, ow, because two shots health? from Senna Listen, River just took lost? half of River's health? Yeah. 14,000 gold hurts. No one's denying this. All right, Weaver's Wall's coming in. JoJo and the rest of C9 ready to block 100 Thieves away from the Tier 3 turret in bottom lane. They got 10 seconds left on Baron, but that's plenty of time. Inhibitor now under pressure here as C9 will just continue whittling it away. Berserker's got the range to keep poking on the thing. Dredge line hits a minion. Ayla hits the ground. C9's got a 5v4. The inhibitor's still in their sight. Fudge looking maybe for an angle here for the ulti. Mom comes in. Blabber's burning, but he ain't low enough just yet. Meech trying to stay away from the Unraveled Earth as River wants an entry point, using the ulti to knock Blabber back into the rest nice of the team. Gun. But now Meech is dead. Fudge has him locked up. Beaten down. C9 should just walk it in for the win. Four players still alive in the enemy base as Quid tries to survive, but he'll die on the steps of his own base. Sniper is stuck back in the fountain. C9 are running the show. Game number one. They made this look one-sided. They'll take down 100 Thieves. Yeah, statement game one victory from C9, especially, again, in that final team fight you saw. Fudge understood the assignment, right? Yeah. He's like, their win condition is Smolder. I need to get on this dragon as soon as possible. I think this is a great victory for C9, not only because of execution, but again, the draft they locked in, they knew exactly how they wanted to pilot it. Blabber got involved early. We didn't see any yeah. of the early pathing shenanigans that we usually see from River to be able to help out his lanes. And it really started with that mid jungle synergy that we've wanted to see from Blabber and Jojo all year. And I think statement game one for Cloud9 for yeah. sure. They were two wins behind 100 Thieves in the regular season. They are very clear that they do not think regular season matters whatsoever. They just took the side selection advantage completely away from 100 Thieves in game one. They need two more wins to move on to the winner's final. JoJo's final comment in the all chat as the Nexus exploded was, wow, second place team, scary. So he's clearly feeling the mute Cloud him. 9 momentum need in him. game number one. A reminder to all you fans at home, you can cast your own votes for Kia MVP and Kia All Pro this year. Head over to KiaLCSAwards.com to place your vote now. But it's time now to head on back to the lounge to break it all down.
Thank you, Flowers, and welcome back to the Lounge fans, and welcome back to the Stage Cloud 9. They are so back. They deserve so much credit for this game. I feel like that is the best game I've seen Cloud9 play in months, honestly. Uh, I've got my trusty observer over here, Mr. Azale, the Azale. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> the Obzale is going to set us up with some replays here. Number one, I just want to point out some things that are really intelligent that Cloud9 did, and you might not be able to see during the live game. One of the biggest things was how quickly Cloud9 started out with a lead, and Blabber deserves so much credit. Quid actually has Flash. But look how Blabber hovers outside of Quid's vision. So when JoJo goes for this seismic shove onto Quid, he's thinking, oh, I don't have to flash JoJo's seismic shove because look, the, the HP is so low. We have uh, River coming around. It's not going to be deadly. But Blabber comes from outside of vision, hovering around with his flash play here on the Lee Sin. And if we roll it through, then once you've let the seismic shove hit, you're just dead. And he blows the flash afterwards too. So as you already know, they do a repeat there. JoJo gets a solo kill, and Cloud9 start their early gold lead. Another really good example of Cloud9 outplay was in the bottom lane here. Berserker and Vulcan playing the 2v3, and they play it so incredibly well that they even turn around a kill, uh, which gives them so much pressure. Already, the Senna Tom Kench earning their own turret plates, so much aggression, that 100 Thieves feel like they have to teleport gank down here. And once the teleport does end up coming in, we'll see uh, Sniper is the one who's going to try and teleport in. They're like, we got to put a stop to all this pressure. Cloud9 bottom lane is putting on us. They use the ultimate. Berserker, look at that. He dodges in to dodge the Q uh, from Aatrox so that he can also land the point blank uh, snare. Let's rewind it here, Mr. Azale. Thank you yep. very much, sir. Thank you, uh, Assistant Azale. <laughs> thank you, uh, Azur Azurver. Uh, we'll go a little bit slower. Okay. So the first one, let's go through and we'll, we'll look at Berserker first. So as Berserker's coming up, uh, Sniper's going to come in with his Q1, and Berserker has his extra move speed from his Wraith form, so he dodges the sweet spot, and he gets really close so he can land the this, this snare guaranteed. Once the snare is landed, he uses the heal, and then he just flashes away from the second one. Now we'll take a look at what Vulcan does, because Vulcan in the other side of the 2v3 is putting damage into the Nautilus already, and he spits him out right where the Senna ult is coming through. So they even get a turnaround kill, 2v3. Then of course he goes straight for the blast cone. Uh, you can speed it back up now because it's just gonna be Tom Kench running away. He saves his gray health for maximum effect of the gray health. <laughs> thank you, thank you for the style zoom in as well. <laughs> really good camera work there. The swag walk, uh, the swag walk. I get some, some applause in the chat? <laughs> Very well done uh, uh, observer here, Azale. You got a future career. Well, uh, uh, Raz, how you doing? I mean, that was that was a massive game for Cloud9. Obviously, I was the one who was most like on the 100 Thieves hype train. Yes. but. So much credit to Cloud9. They're, they're actually so back. I feel like the, the practice that they must have put in this last week, already paying off. Their, their play is so much cleaner. Yeah. The coordination was really clean. I even super enjoyed their team composition. Mm -hmm. When you have the, the top lane Twisted Fate coming in late yeah. to supplement a Talia, your map pressure is insane. You've got, you know, Senna ultimate, you've got Talia ultimate, and you have Twisted Fate ultimate. And if Blabber is playing out of his mind on Lee Sin making all these plays, then you just have such an aggressive team comp. I think 100 Thieves for sure need to look back on their draft. Maybe they will stick to what they were prepping for game one and then try and apply it in game two. Mm. Like Nautilus for sure was just going to get punished the most you can possibly get punished. You're, you're going into a, a, a Talia that's all, of course, difficult, a Tom Kench, so the first pick is not going to be the one that gets the kill. You're also walking into a uh, Twisted Fate gold card for objectives. So the, how Cloud9 played Drakes and also how they played uh, the Rift Herald really early on made it really difficult for 100 Thieves to walk in. And then, of course, of course, it's built for side laning. So um, the one thing that I wanted to mention that you already kind of hit on with your Telestrator, yes, mid lane got ahead because of that play. Top lane was ahead because of the matchup. Bot lane had a sizable lead, and we did not even oh, pan yeah. down the, the camera to really see what was going on there. So it was really reminiscent of the first game that these teams had in the uh, early portions of the split. So 100 Thieves have selected blue side. To touch on, on the bot lane, Berserker, last time he played Senna, got a lot of flack for how bad his soul collection was. As the Nexus died in that game, at 31 minutes, he had about 80 souls. Yeah. In this game, he hit that mark before 17 minutes. So much better from Cloud9. They are looking really good in game number one. But we're going to have to see if 100 Thieves can strike back. Game two coming up next.
cover more ground in the Kia Sportage Turbo Hybrid. Kia, movement that inspires. Red Bull gives you wings.